And our subject in the short time we have is our three greatest needs in life. Our three greatest needs. We come to this passage of Christ restoring sight to a blind man at Jericho. Before we begin, immediately there are criticisms of the passage. This is recorded in three Gospels, in Matthew, Mark and Luke. And on the surface, there appear to be some discrepancies in the account. Matthew says there were two blind men. Mark and Luke mention only one. And of course, people howl and they say, well, you cannot trust or rely upon the Bible. And people who really don't know what they're speaking of uh, point to this and claim another inaccuracy, another discrepancy. But also there's an even greater seeming discrepancy in that uh, Matthew and Mark say that this restoration of sight to the blind, one or two men, occurred as Christ with his disciples and a great crowd following him was leaving the city of Jericho. Whereas Luke records that it happened as he was drawing near the city of Jericho. But if only people would check on what they're talking about and uh, then all these things wouldn't circulate because it is a historical fact that there was an old Jericho and a new Jericho and both the old and the later Jericho built by Herod the Great have been greatly excavated by archaeologists and their history is well known and attested and they were less than a mile in part, apart. In fact, both the old Jericho and the newer Jericho are both now in the modern city. However, the old Jericho was largely a ruin. But uh, many dwellings, a uh, kind of village spread all the way around it, and the road went right through it, and then on and through the newer Jericho built by Herod the Great just lying to the south so the very best place for a beggar to station himself and no doubt there were more than this blind man probably quite a party of them their regular pitches along the roadside the best place for them to be was where the traffic was not only the distance traffic but the local traffic passing to and fro between the old and the new parts of the city but if people would only check their criticisms before they made them. And so it's obvious that Christ had left the old with the ruins and the village part of Jericho and was entering to the new. There are no discrepancies in the scripture that cannot be accounted for. Well, when I say no, there are some we don't understand, but very, very few. Nothing like the number that are constantly pointed to by cynics and critics. One of the very astonishing and remarkable things about the Bible is its consistent character and its accuracy across all its books. And more and more, where there are apparent problems, uh, archaeology has solved them and explained that these were not discrepancies at all. Well, I don't want to waste your time on that, but it's worth raising that. It may be there's somebody here or some people here this evening who have been uh, uh, brought to believe that the Bible is unreliable. Well, you bring any of these discrepancies you like and you will be shown the other side, the explanation. And you will see in the vast majority of cases that there is a perfectly reasonable explanation for the supposed discrepancy. And people are jumping before they know what they're talking about. So I just make mention of that. But coming down to verse 35, it came to pass that as he was come nigh unto Jericho, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. I suppose I ought to read the words that Christ spoke just before this event from verse 31 then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them behold we go up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man shall be accomplished for he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles and shall be mocked 
and spitefully entreated and spitted on, and they shall scourge him, the terrible whippings of those days, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Well, this was his last journey. This journey now down through the countryside and down through Jericho and on to Jerusalem, this was his final journey before those uh, terrible trials and his execution. He allowed his arrest. That's the astonishing thing. He allowed his crucifixion to take place because, as he explained to the disciples, that's what he'd come for. That's what he had come from glory to carry out. Now, when you look at this healing miracle, the restoring of sight to this blind man, Mark names him. He calls him Bartimaeus. As to the discrepancy that Matthew and Mark mention, Matthew mentions two, and the other Gospels one, well, uh, we can explain why Mark probably mentioned only one of the two, because Bartimaeus was known to him. So it had been natural for him to do that. And as for Luke, well, it was Bartimaeus who was probably the spokesman for the two. So Luke concentrates on the one who spoke these grand words and showed us the way and the approach to God. Well, here's the blind man. And verse 36, hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. The other Gospels say it was a very vast number, a very great, unusually great multitude. Well, he was going to Jerusalem, and there were pilgrims on the way, crowding with him. But the blind man didn't know what was going on. And verse 37, they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passes by. Now, they all wanted to be near him and to follow him because, of course, the land had never seen a miracle worker like Jesus Christ the Lord. He healed literally thousands of people, according to the record. He healed people who could not possibly have got better by any known means of the day. He restored sight to the blind. He had raised the dead. He'd done extraordinary things. He'd, people had seen wizened, shriveled limbs fill out before their eyes as the lame were healed. And so naturally, he attracted vast crowds. And he always preached to them. And his message could be summed up. Well, it was remarkable. It was authoritative. But it was invariably about repentance before God and remission of sin, including forgiveness of all sin and the need to approach God repentantly and be reconciled with him. But they were not so interested, the crowds, in the message, although they were fascinated by the way Christ taught, they were not so interested in the message as they were in the healings. So what was going to take place? What would he do? What spectacle could they see? And they thronged around him. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. Well, that's extraordinary. Because even though he was the great miracle worker, and even though many thought he must be the promised Messiah, prophesied, foretold throughout the Old Testament books, nevertheless, most people were very reluctant to believe that. And so they told him, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. They put him down only as a man. He may be an astonishing man and a remarkable man, but the way the title they give him, the way they describe him, sets him no higher than being a man. Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. But the blind man... He addressed him in a rather different way. And in verse 38, you see it. I'm just going to simply follow the narrative this evening. And the blind man, he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. That's a very religious form of address. Jesus, thou son of David. 
Of course, he was blind. He could not read the ancient scriptures and the promises for himself, but he'd heard them read in the local synagogue and when he'd travelled with the crowd up to the temple in Jerusalem, he'd heard the scriptures read repeatedly and he knew that when the Messiah came, he would be the son of David, the great descendant promised to King David, who would be divine, who would be God incarnate, who would live and reign forever. And so he addresses him as the son of David. He believed he was more than a man. That blind man believed that he was God. He'd reasoned to himself as he'd heard all the talk and he'd heard the records of the miracles and his teaching. He concluded this must be the Messiah, the Son of God, so long promised. Now, of course, most people at that particular time had departed from the teaching of the Old Testament and the Messiah they believed in and expected when he came would be only a political Messiah, one who would get rid of the Roman occupying forces and restore the fortunes of their country and its prosperity and greatness. But this man clearly believed more Jesus, thou son of David, he identifies him in messianic terms. And then he says, have mercy on me. And that's loaded language, friends. One of the terrible things that was taught at that particular time, and it certainly didn't come from the scriptures, but one of the things that many taught at that time in the, the history of the Jews was that blindness was a punishment for sin. And you rather think this man believed this himself, that his blindness was a judgment of God upon him for something either he had done or for something that he was yet to do. Even that they believed. A judgment for something you would do in the future. And so when he asks for his sight, he asks for it in terms of a plea for mercy. But then I expect he went further And he said to himself, yes, I do deserve judgment. I am a sinful man. It may have been unfair to him what the people said in those days, but he believed it of himself, that I am somebody who needs the mercy of God. Not just the mercy of healing, restoration of sight, but mercy and forgiveness, pardon for my sin. And that's what he calls for. Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they tried to shut him up. And this is very significant. Verse 39. And they which went before from the crowd rebuked him. It's put slightly more forcefully in Matthew's gospel. They rebuked him. They didn't just say, be quiet. You're making a nuisance of yourself. You're causing a distraction. They went for him. And rebuked him that he should hold his peace, that he should shut up, if you like. But when they did so, he cried so much the more, repeatedly, and probably more loudly, Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Well, that's what happens when we seek God, when we look for him. Every time Christ worked a miracle, it was more than a miracle. It has been said, and it's true, every miracle performed by Christ was also a sermon. The old preachers used to put it in old-fashioned English, but we still have the words today. As he wrought, so he taught. As he did, performed the miracles, so he taught. Not only by literally teaching, but the miracle taught. The miracles were, number one, they were proofs, evidence of his divine power. Number two, they were demonstrations of how he would deal with souls, of the spiritual healing that he could bring about in the lives of all who sought him. Did you know that? 
Every healing miracle depicts the way in which Christ deals with souls. They're demonstrations. The blind man. Well, blindness, of course, stood very obviously in the minds of the people for ignorance. Blindness also stood for poverty, because if you were blind in those days, you would become destitute and you couldn't work and there's nothing you could do. Blindness represented dependence. You depended upon the goodwill of others in those days. No means had developed to enable people who were blind to express their powers and gifts and abilities. So you were poor and you were dependent and you sat by the side of the road and you begged and depended on the charity of others. And all that applies to us because uh, we are spiritually blind before we're converted to God and we don't understand the things of God and we're alienated from God and we don't understand the way of salvation or if we understand the theory of it we don't see it, grasp it very deeply. And we are dependent too. We're poor naive creatures if we don't understand God's explanation as to how things have come about and why people in this world, all of us, are sinners and depraved as we are. If we don't understand these things, well, we're represented by the blind man. We're blind in our souls. And we're dependent upon all the opinions that are given to us by others. That blind man was dependent upon the passing crowd for information. What he could pick up. He couldn't find out things for himself, and so are we. Now, the age in which we live is particularly fond of telling us there is no God, there was no creation, there is no soul, there is no uh, sin, no such thing as fixed absolute morality, there's no day of judgment, there's no having to give an account for the life you've lived. It wasn't always like that, but it is today. And being blind, we just pick up these things. And these are the things we believe. And these are the things we think. And so blindness well represents us. Shut off from God. No experience of him. No experience of prayer or his power. Never met with him. Never related to him. So the healing of a blind man always represents on when Christ performs such a miracle, how a demonstration of how he can deal with our spiritual blindness and need. But back to this passage. He cried, saying, verse 38, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they rebuked him. Now, if you come to see your need of God's forgiveness, which is your greatest need, your number one greatest need is the forgiveness of God. Your number two greatest need is life that he alone can give you. Spiritual life. So that your soul is alive and functioning. Now if you come to see your need and you call upon God, you will immediately find forces against you to stop you. Inside you, outside you. Now that crowd, very forcefully, they said, be quiet, shut up, we don't want to hear you, you're a disturbance, you're distract, Jesus of Nazareth, hold your peace. But he wouldn't, he persisted. This is how it works with you and me, when we begin to take spiritual things seriously. When we say to ourselves, I believe I am a created being. There is a God in heaven. There is one to whom I must give account. I am concerned about my sinful ways, my fallen character. I need a reconciliation with God. I want to listen to this. Then a thousand voices will immediately start to tell us, you don't want to believe that. You, you, you may be among your colleagues at work. You may be the star of the office. You may be the most brilliant person there, or at least somebody who's highly respected, and people who admire you, and uh, like you, and relate to you, 
As soon as they think that you're seeking God and you want forgiveness and life, well, they'll do everything they can to pull you away. You will lose your popularity. You may be ostracized. You may be regarded as peculiar. That, that's a distraction, an opposition, which is very, very difficult for you to cope with. Will it sweep you aside? Will it succeed? Or like this blind man. Remember this blind man depended on that crowd. They gave him his few shekels that he lived on and the provisions he needed. If he upset them, if he ignored them, well, maybe he wouldn't get it anymore. So they had power. They had clout, as they say, in his life. But he cried out all the more. Now your own heart will tell you, I can't go this way. I can't listen to the word of God, to preaching. I can't entertain thoughts of Christ and turning to him and repenting of my sin. Your own heart will say, you'd have to give up this and give up that. And give, you, you'll probably exaggerate greatly what you have to give up. You don't have to give up anything wholesome at all. But you'll have to give up all your selfish personal ambitions and your self-indulgence in sinful things. And your heart may put you off and denounce you and say, don't go this way, don't do this. Maybe people who are very close to you will. But this man, because he saw that only Christ could help him, only Christ could give him his sight, they couldn't do it, the crowd couldn't do it, the highest people in society couldn't help him, only God could help him. When you come to that point in your life, only God can clean me within, only God can change me, only God can forgive me. Only God can give me eternity and heaven and a new life and relate me to himself. Then nothing will put you off. You need to see that. You need to see how Christ has done it. How he came from the glorious courts of heaven. How he went to Calvary's cross voluntarily, willingly. You need to see what happened on Calvary's cross. Maybe you don't know. Maybe you know some of the external history that Christ suffered and died in agony, nailed to a cross, having been scourged by Roman authority until the wounds ran with blood. And then he hung with people taunting and shouting and screaming and insulting. And he died there on Calvary's cross, bleeding, you may think, to death. But you know, if you know about that, you only know a fraction of what happened on Calvary's cross. Because that was the Son of God incarnate, the God-man. God had to bear away our sin because no man could have done it on our behalf. And yet he had to do it as a man and suffer as a man to properly atone for our sin. The incarnation of the second person of the Trinity and his death on Calvary. What was that death? Did he pay the price, the eternal punishment due to me for my sin with the pain of nails through hands and feet? Was that enough? No, it was nothing like enough. He suffered a deep, an unseen burden of punishment and guilt from God laid upon his holy soul. Half the time he spent on Calvary's cross was under total darkness. It couldn't be seen. And he hung and suffered there, literally taking the eternal weight of punishment due to us for our sin if we believe in him. It was an inward punishment. It was an alienation from the Father he had to feel. It was terrible and indescribable feelings and sensations. So severe, so great, that the punishment due to billions was taken in his holy soul and borne away 
When you grasp what he did, the price he paid, the lengths to which he went to bring about salvation for us, to pay the price of our sin on our behalf, well, it overwhelms us. And whatever our hearts say, or whatever distractions we get from other people, we say, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me. Pardon and forgive all my sin. That's what this miracle is about, dear friends. Now in verse 41, or in verse 40, Jesus stood, which means he stood still, and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, by the way, Mark's gospel says this man came with such alacrity that he threw away, cast away his coat. He had such certainty that Christ would restore his sight. He felt he'd have no further need of that old ragged coat. He was going to be a new man. Luke doesn't tell us that detail, but he comes directly to the Lord saying, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? That's strange. He's Christ. He's God. He knows all things. It is obvious he's a blind man. Why does he ask him what he wants? Isn't it obvious? Yes, it's obvious. But the man must articulate it. He must spell it out. It's for the benefit of the crowd, for one thing, but it's also for the man. He must specifically ask for what he requires, and that's God's way. When you come to him, you can't come to him vaguely. You can't come to him with only half an understanding. You can't come to him in a mental muddle. You come to him knowing what it is you're asking for and you must be precise about it and that also marks your sincerity. You have to come and say, Lord, forgive this evil man, this evil woman. Forgive my sin. Now, if you're a proud person and amazingly, you don't think you have much sin. And that's the trouble with so many of us before we're converted. In all seriousness, we don't see ourselves as sinners. We flatter ourselves in our own eyes. And we don't get it. Well, you can't repent. You can't repent of your sin and receive the forgiveness of God unless you spell it out. Unless you can acknowledge it and state it. Lord, I am a sinner. I have sinned against thee. I have sinned against others. I have all kinds of horrible character traits. I have lied. I have been selfish and self-centered. I have been proud. Tell him. Acknowledge it. You can't have forgiveness without repentance. You don't have to make a full inventory of all your sin. That would be too much for the Lord to ask of you. It would take you months but you must acknowledge in reasonable terms that you know you're a sinner and you deserve the condemnation of God and you deserve judgment and plead for his mercy and his forgiveness. Don't try to claim that you have certain goodness with which to please him and bring to him anything that's good in you. Well, it isn't anything like enough. It's almost as nothing when compared with the bad. So you must articulate it. And then you must articulate what you want. This blind man said, Lord, have mercy upon me all that I may receive my sight. That was everything to him. Why, if he could only have his sight, he could work, he could read, he could be independent, he could see for himself. He could live, he could support others, he could do so much. Having sight was the key to it all. Having forgiveness is the key to so much. If you have forgiveness, you can pray. 
If you have forgiveness, God will give you a new life. God will give you a new nature. God will give you spiritual faculties and you'll relate to him and prove him. God will give you a new purpose in life. Oh, so much hinges on whether I am forgiven. That's the first and the most important thing, to have the forgiveness of God. You must spell it out and tell him too you want life in your spirit. You want communion with him. You want his blessing from above. You want to have a new and a clean character. Ask him for these things and tell him you trust in Christ alone that he suffered and died to purchase your soul, that he suffered and died to, do, to pay the price and the punishment of sin on your behalf. So that's how we understand this remarkable miracle and its meaning. Christ said, What wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight. And listen to these words. Thy faith hath saved thee. He trusted in Christ, not in himself. And immediately he received his sight. Did you know that? That the moment you come to Christ with a sincere heart, I am that sinner. Lord, forgive me. I see it now. I acknowledge it. Pardon and forgive me. I need new life, a new understanding, a new heart. Lord, forgive me and make me a child of God. The moment you say that from a sincere heart, immediately you are his. It isn't the teaching of the Bible that this is a lifelong endeavor to be converted. Conversion is a crisis. It's something that happens relatively speedily when you come to God with a sincere heart and you trust in Christ and repent of your sin. Immediately he received his sight and so will you and followed him. He followed Christ. This was the last journey to Jerusalem. This is speculation. But did he follow him in the sense that he went all the way to Jerusalem? That he saw him in his arrest and his suffering and death on Calvary's cross? That he was in the crowd of disciples when the news came, he's risen from the dead? Did he, was he even among the crowd that saw him? Did he follow him after that into the great adventure of the new church and the thousands that were converted? and the evidence of God's power that they had. Immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. And when they saw it, they too gave praise unto God. If you are converted, if your life is changed, if you come to Christ, the people who knew you before, including the people who tried to stop you, they will acknowledge and realize you're a new woman. You're a new man. There's so much which is different about you. You were mean. You're now generous. You told half-truths and lies. And now you can't do that. You're a different person and a better person and a deeper person and a kinder person. Dear friends, may it be so. Come to Christ. Let him forgive you. Let him change you. It's one last thing I must say as we close. And that's this. When the blind man asked the great multitude what the commotion was all about, they told him, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. What a statement that is. That blind man had heard about Christ and his healing power and he believed he was divine and he must have thought to himself, passing by, passing by, I haven't got much time. This will be my only opportunity. I cannot see, I cannot travel. 
if he's here and then gone in a moment, I shall never be able to call upon him again. And he took his opportunity and he called out repeatedly, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Now I don't want to engage in any emotional manipulation and I'm sure anyway you would be very resistant to it. But I do have to tell you this. You're in a church tonight and you're listening to a message about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It could be that this is your only opportunity to call upon him from your heart. It could be, it could be that if you do not do so, God will never challenge your heart again. Christ will never call out in your presence again. Jesus of Nazareth, second person of the Trinity, incarnate Son of God, passeth by. Call out to him while it's on your heart, while you realize you need conversion and forgiveness and new life and heaven. Call out to him while you can, just in case the opportunity never returns. Let's pray together. O oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, look upon us, search our hearts, challenge our souls. O oh Lord, we feel for those who are outside thy kingdom, as we have all been. O oh Lord, we pray that thou wilt speak to every heart and draw people near, that their lives may be given up to thee, that they may know thee and prove thee and love thee. Come in all thy saving power and deal with our souls and draw to Christ. We ask these things in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.